my stand slightly off centre here. That might look like I've been tortured. Um, thanks everybody for coming tonight. Um, actually, whenever we opened up the booking for this, it was all booked out in two days and we had set up the right side for an overflow. But as typical, uh, happened, didn't turn up, and then we have the overflow ready and nobody's, we don't need it. So, anyway, it's typical of Dublin and uh, that. So, anyway, tonight, um, it's been, I said, it's a great pleasure to have uh, BJ with us tonight. Um, he contacted us about a couple of weeks ago to say he'd be in Ireland and would be willing to um, launch his book. Um, so we, without, without a second thought, we uh, took the opportunity with both hands and to uh, put on tonight, allow uh, BJ to speak about the book, but also to speak about, in general, about uh, uh, global politics and um, how he sees the things in the world today. Um, so people here tonight probably know VJ from, from probably the books he's written. Uh, he's written over 20 books. Um, the ones are probably the recent ones that people have known would have been Red Star over the East and, uh, and the um, Washington Bullets. And the latest one is uh, The Withdrawal, which deals with, um, among other things, the American uh, sort of retreat and debacle uh, of what is, was in Afghanistan, uh, Iraq, Libya, that uh, the trail of destruction over the last three decades across the Middle East uh, has been horrendous. The number of people killed, uh, and most of them are illegal wars, uh, dressed up sometimes with a sort of dodgy UN mandate. But in the main, they are illegal wars, and millions of people have died. Tens of millions have suffered greatly from uh, the after effects of those wars. Um, and still die because of the use of depleted uranium and the uh, and this, the destruction of the agricultural industries. And so it's been a huge disaster for the last three decades as the United States continues to assert its military power uh, and stronghold and strength across the globe. Um, and uh, there's no signs of it abating. It's intensifying its its global military strategy of building uh, dozens of bases now in Africa. Uh, attempt to encircle China in the, in the South China Seas. So these are all areas which have, not, they're, not just, they're not far away, these places are no longer far away. What happens in these places affects us, just like the proxy war in Ukraine. It is affecting us. It's affecting us. You know, turn on your electricity now, you turn on your light, you turn on your gas cooker, you turn on your central heating, you begin to worry, oh, how what the bill going to be like here. So it's directly coming back to us. But they're all saying the chickens are coming home to roost. So we've got a big responsibility, a big question spaces. Do we take the, accept the narrative presented by the West that there are democratic uh, enablers? Or is once again just old forms of colonialism, neo-colonialism dressed up in contemporary bourgeois concepts of democracy? So I think these are all big questions. It's a big challenge to the left in Europe and North America, because many of them knowingly or unknowingly, view the world through imperialist eyes. Well, they might think they're not, but in reality, they talk the same language, but the people in these parts of the world really don't really understand the sophistication of democracy, and therefore socialism has to come in a certain character, in certain ways, and if it's not coming those ways, then it's not really socialism according to the textbook. And it's very much similar to the colonialists when they walked in with the guns in the Bible, and we'll show you what civilization is, we'll show you how to, how to develop yourselves. So I'm not going any further, I'll just say, just welcome everybody. BJ has been given a free hand. Well, <laughs> uh, I, I have seen him on YouTube. I've seen him on YouTube, you know what? He's got he's, uh, one of the hands behind, we'll hold on to him a bit. But we'll, uh, we'll be given him a half an hour or more to outline his thinking, the book, and contemporary politics. Then we followed up with uh, questions and answers, um, and uh, then so the nights we don't want to be here all night, and so but but we are flexible, we are flexible, and uh, Judge one is running out of steam, or when BJ is running out of steam, and then we'll go to the shop, and there'll be a glass of wine there, and then we to buy the book, uh, BJ will be there to sign it. So uh, with those few words, BJ. Okay. Great.
great to be here, although I can't see you, but uh, <laughs> it is really great to be here. Thanks a lot. Uh, several years ago, I just walked into this bookshop um, and we met briefly and I said, you know, you've got to join Red Books Day. Uh, it's this initiative we have internationally to rescue the collective life. 21st of February, read the Communist Manifesto in your own language. It's the date of the publication of the manifesto. It's also Mother, Mother Language Day. And, well, you were the first to do Red Books Day in Ireland. So congratulations to all of you. And the reason I say congratulations is now a million people joined this year. And by next year, um, we hope two million. And in time, we hope that Red Books Day will become one of those events on the calendar of the left. We have very few events on the calendar of the left, actually. Um, you know, May Day is there, yes. Hiroshima Day has disappeared, largely. Uh, we want to revive, I think, days on the calendar of the left in order to rescue the collective life uh, for us. Um, not allow festivals of a religious nature and, you know, corporate gatherings to masquerade as, as social life. I think we have actually given up uh, doing these things for too long. And we have to come back into society, produce fun things for young people and so on. So please be aware, on the 21st of February, I hope you'll be involved in Red Books Day in some way uh, or form. Well, I really love Noam Chomsky. I don't know about you, but I really love him because I was a young reporter and I wrote to him in the early 1990s and I said, you know, I'm working on this story on... Um, what's happening to the labor markets in India and particularly, um, you know, uh, oppressed caste workers and so on. And I was writing to him from, from Delhi and he wrote me back um, on letterhead and he signed it. it. It was typed letter and I thought, who writes letters like that, you know, back to an unknown person? And since then, and I recount this in the afterward of this book, um, he's written to me, Every time I've engaged him, he's written back. And most strikingly, uh, a few years later, when I wrote to him and said, something terrible seems to be happening in Turkey, and I don't understand it, and my editor has said, go to Eastern Turkey to cover what's going on there, but I don't know anything. And he wrote me a really long letter explaining the Kurdish struggle in great detail. And he said, be careful, you know, it's dangerous and so on. And, a number of letters he wrote afterwards saying, I really worry, you know, you're going to be careful. Maybe, but it, it was good advice because it's not easy to actually cover the Kurdish story inside Turkey. Um, he's a tremendous person and when I said to him, let's do this um, a book on um, the withdrawal of the United States from Afghanistan, Iraq and Libya, he thought, well, that's a good idea because um, you know, we need to explain to a new generation um, the context of these wars. That there's an entire new generation that doesn't know, for instance, that these were all unnecessary wars. After all, let's take the case of Afghanistan, um, where just a few days short of the 11th of September, which has become now not so much about the coup in Chile in 1973, but it's become about the attack on the United States in 2001. So if we look at the war against the Af Afghan people, it's a curious war because um, right after the 11th of September, by good evidence, and we got this from Abdul Haq, who was a Mujahideen leader in northern Pakistan and so on, um, and also from the Taliban speaking to the press at the time, they said, we'll hand over bin Laden to you, you know? But what we need is, we need two guarantees. One, first guarantee, we'd like you to send us a dossier with evidence showing that Al-Qaeda is indeed responsible for these attacks. Now, it's a perfectly decent thing to ask for because that's how extradition works. You know the word extradition. Um, you might have been following the case of Julian Assange, for instance, in the middle of a torture by the British state as a consequence of an extradition request from the United States. He wasn't handed over immediately. Why didn't the United States bomb Britain, for instance? It's a pretty good idea, actually. Uh, now, they, have, uh, they might have been saved from uh, you know, Liz Truss as the prime minister and, and, and all these other things. But of course, 
Um, it's unthinkable for the United States to bomb the United Kingdom to claim the body of Julian Assange, but it's perfectly legitimate to bomb Afghanistan because they are barbarians after all. And barbarians deserve to be bombed, whereas you know, good civilized people across the Atlantic should be engaged through the good offices of the law and so on. It's what I call the international division of humanity. It's real, friends. How many of you know the colors of the Yemeni flag? And yet, the Ukrainian flag colors are ubiquitous. Uh, you know, it's interesting how the feeling uh, in the public rises to have solidarity with certain people, but not others. Uh, not the Iraqis, certainly not the Afghans, definitely not the Libyans. What does the Libyan flag look like? Anybody? What does the What's, what are the colors of the Libyan flag? I suppose that's a good guess, right? But are you guessing or did you put it up on your Facebook profile? <laughs> uh, unlikely. I, I think unlikely that it was on anybody's Facebook pro profile, Eugene. I, do you have Facebook? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you. you I wouldn't have any friends. Well, <laughs> I like to keep it that way. Well, that's a bad thing to say, Eugene. You're, you're a communist. The world is your friend. <laughs> so, um, the point being that, you know, they said, you can have him, but give us the dossier first. We'd like to get the evidence. By the way, Robert Mueller, who was the head of the FBI, eight months after the United States started to bomb Afghanistan in October of 2001, at a press conference where he said we're reasonably sure that Al-Qaeda was responsible. Eight months after the bombing began, we're reasonably sure. This is in the public record. Um, the second thing that the Taliban said was, we'll hand him over, but to a third party. We don't want to hand him over to the United States because you'll just kill him directly. Not a bad thought from them, given the drone assassination program that eventually developed which of course was a extrajudicial killing program that the United States conducted and, and still conducts against even US citizens, in fact, against minors. For instance, the son of Awlaki killed in Yemen, a 16-year-old boy, US citizen. Um, I don't know why they killed a 16-year-old, um, but Obama has never answered that question. He was asked that question by Medea Benjamin of Court Pink, not directly, but she asked him about the drone program and, and he said condescendingly, what she's asking is important. Uh, everybody should listen to this young woman. By the way, Medea Benjamin is older than Obama. So there's your slight hint of condescension. Um, you know. So the second thing they said is give him to, uh, we'll give him to a third party, maybe Pakistan or somewhere. Well, eventually they gave him to Pakistan, but on slightly different terms. Uh, and that took 10 years for the US to discover. Well, the United States said no. They said, we're going to whack you. Same thing with Iraq. Um, good evidence. Saddam, both in 1991 and in 2002-2003, said, listen, don't bomb us. We know you can destroy our country. Don't do it. We'll do whatever we want. Hans Blix has been to every single site, government site, non-government site in Iraq cannot find weapons of mass destruction. By the way, Hans Blick is not a Ba'ath Party member. Respected European uh, diplomat, long time uh, person who worked in the UN bureaucracy and so on. Saddam said, I'll do anything. You know, the first thing he said to the Americans in 1991 was absurd. Actually, late 1990. No, wait a minute, August, ah, that's interesting. S Saddam <laughs> sends his forces into Iraq, into Kuwait, on 2nd of August 1990, two weeks later, he tells the Americans, okay, I'll withdraw. This is almost unknown to people outside. Okay, I'll withdraw. But the terms of withdrawal were rather absurd. He said, I'll withdraw if the Israelis withdraw from Palestine. <laughs> okay, interesting, interesting. Eventually, he said, okay, fine. I'll, we'll come up with another formula. Second formula, he said, was, I'll withdraw, but you have to give me a... Um, an honorable withdrawal. Of course, he didn't give him that. But in each of these cases, including Gaddafi in Libya, the other party said, I want to negotiate. The United States said no. So Noam and I started saying, well, this is a lot like the Godfather. Um, these guys are like the mafia, you know. Um, you just do what we tell you, and if you don't do what we tell you, we're going to whack you. Of course, my entire understanding of the mafia comes from the film The Godfather and from The Sopranos. Uh, <laughs> season one, I'd say, because after that it degenerates. But, um, 
And you know, even in the even in the, the Sopranos, especially in the Godfather, they always have the sit down. You know, they sit down with their adversaries because they come with guns and so on. But they negotiate a little bit before they cut off heads and throw it in beds and so on. The United States government seems unwilling to negotiate at all. Um, in, in the case of Ukraine, it's interesting. I don't know if you read Foreign Affairs, the journal, and you may have looked at this article in the current issue, September issue, written by Fiona Hill. Fiona Hill is not a liberal. She is a British-born um, person who was the advisor to that great humanitarian John Bolton. Uh, you may know John Bolton, who believed that 11 floors of the UN building should be blown up. Public statement made by Bolton, a national security advisor to, um, to Trump. Well, Fiona Hill worked for Bolton, highly respected in, in those circles, you know, of what we sometimes call the deep state, but could also just be called a national security agency world in, in Washington, D.C. In this article, in which she writes about how Putin is a monster and so on, it's interesting. It's interesting to get that opinion. There's a paragraph where she says, for the first time I've seen this on the record, that in mid-April, the Ukrainians and the Russians came, to, came they, they had an interim peace agreement. Very interesting. I hadn't seen that in any other mainstream periodical. I'd heard rumors of this. Uh, Lavrov had said it briefly at some point and so on, but this was not something that the establishment had said had taken place. Very interesting. Mid-April. What was the agreement? Well, Fiona Hill just has two facts in there. One, she says, is Russia will return to the um, 22nd of September line. They'll withdraw from, from the positions inside Ukrainian territory. And second, Ukraine will make a public declaration, no joining NATO. Seems like Minsk too, in a way, what they'd agreed to. And then, that other tremendous man from Britain <laughs> swoops into Kiev with his unruly hair. <laughs> to tell Zelensky, don't take the deal. Now that's interesting. She doesn't mention this in her article, but it's interesting, they had a deal, and then the British and the US were putting pressure on Zelensky not to take the deal. That sounds a lot like the situation in the Iraq war, Afghanistan, and they just don't like to negotiate, why? I'm not gonna answer the question here, we discuss it at length, but I just want to put it out there. They don't want to negotiate. Norman, I thought, it's a good idea to put together in a readable format for younger people uh, some of these stories, which are completely, have been completely disappeared from the public record. Like, nobody remembers that Gaddafi said, please come and solve the issue. And he asked the African Union. And an African Union team was ready to get to um, Tripoli when Sarkozy said, no, we're going to bomb you. By the way, Sarkozy, whose last election campaign was funded by Gaddafi. Um, it's a good reason not to fund scoundrels like Sarkozy. Um, so you have this record of refusal to negotiate, which is completely forgotten, needs to be brought back. So a lot of what we do in this book is to return to some of the buried transcripts of this period of war. It's not just an assessment of the withdrawal itself, it's a look back and why these people go to war. Um, and one of the things that is interesting where, you know, Norman, I disagree a little bit on this, is he feels that these wars are, in a sense, unnecessary. I agree to some extent with him. Uh, I, I was never very satisfied with the slogan, no blood for oil. Remember that slogan in, in the massive demonstrations against the attack on Iraq, no blood for oil, 2002, 2003. I was never satisfied with that because, in fact, the oil was already flowing. It's not that, you know, the Iraqis were not providing oil. Um, it's not so much that. Um, it's something else, and I can get to that in a little bit. It's something else. It, it's not controlling the oil directly, owning the oil. It's something else. I'll get to that. Um, so, he and I disagree a little bit. Like on Afghanistan, he, th he thinks it's a useless war. It was utterly useless, but I'm not sure it was that useless. And, and, I, and we can talk about this in the question and answer. You know, were these wars of any value for the West? Because they certainly contributed to the depleting of Western power in a, in a great way. Uh, two other points before I, I end. One is that, you know, privately, not in this um, text, but we've had a long discussion 
about this idea of the decline of the US empire. Now, there are two schools of thought on this. They are diametrically opposed to each other. The first school of thought is the U United States is an incredible place and it will renew itself. Um, you know, this is the second American century. This was the argument made from the far right by Dick Cheney and others that a revival is inevitable uh, because of, you know, Yankee ingenuity. Uh, and right now, the belief that the US will make a better semiconductor chip and therefore wipe China off the planet, you know, by that and so on. Um, there is this belief in the inevitability of permanent U.S. superiority. So that's one school of thought. Um, there's a, a man from, I think he's English, I'm not sure, but he's a, certainly a scoundrel. Um, his name is Niall Ferguson. Do you claim him or? Nothing to do with you. Okay. Well, Ferguson is in that school of thought, you know, the, the kind of inevitable and permanent superiority of the United States, because it has liberal values and so on. Well, interesting. That's one school. The other school of thought popular in sections of the left is the declinist school of thought, that it's over, it's declined, it's, you know, there's no uh, US power anymore. I'm not in favor of either of the schools of thought because I, I don't think they are necessarily fact-based. Um, because if you look at it, power is in different, power manifests itself in different spaces. For instance, there is of course military power, no question. The United States can bomb anybody, uh, anywhere in the world. You know, as you were just saying, over 30 military bases on the African continent. I went to see the military base in Agadez, Niger. It is extraordinarily large. The largest drone base in the world. It's unbelievable. I mean, it's a huge amount of territory. Anybody who talks about Chinese colonialism in Africa has got to be crazy because I've never seen a Chinese base in Africa. They have one a port in Djibouti which is not really a port, it's like a naval station where they run their ships that participate in the UN campaign against piracy. Now, whether anybody should really be participating in a campaign against piracy is a question because they're fighting basically Somali fishermen uh, who've had their fishing knocked out rather than deal with the problem where basically criminalizing them. They are criminals, I mean, they have been hijacking ships. But you've got to deal with it in a deeper way. Anyway, the Chinese do have a naval station in Djibouti. It's not really a base, not like the base in Agadez. Haven't seen much public discussion about US bases now taking over an entire terminal in Accra International Airport in Ghana. Very little coverage. I think I was the only journalist that wrote a story about it in the international press, about how terminal number three has been basically taken over by the US government. Um, and how U.S. troops can walk into Ghana without even a passport. Um, they don't even have to show their military ID. They just get off the planes and walk into Ghana. I, I don't know anybody else except perhaps, you know, unidentified aliens who come in their craft and don't carry passports and walk around the Midwestern United States and give us Superman and so on. They're the only other people I know who can arrive into a country without a passport, you know. Um, it's incredible, even a US diplomat has to carry a diplomatic passport. The troops walk into Ghana without anything. It's, it's quite scandalous. I'm actually surprised the Irish press hasn't picked this story up. Because, um, you know, the Irish press is a free and decent press and it has reported extraordinarily well on the atrocities committed at Shannon Air Base with the, um, you know, extraordinary rendition program and, uh, and so on and so forth. So I'm actually quite surprised, Eugene, that your press uh, the Irish Times in particular, you know, uh, the Irish Times in particular is it's, it's really puzzling to me. Anyway, um, so the United States militarily can clobber anybody, it has enormous power. Politically, there's some problems. It, it doesn't really know once it's clobbered a country how to, how to manage that. It's not very good, as Niall Ferguson said. The United States is not very good at colonialism, he wrote. Uh, after 2003, he said, you've got to take lessons from the British, who we know were really good at colonialism, you know. Um, really, really good at colonialism. Um, so, politically, there is some depletion of U.S. power, but on balance, don't underestimate the power of their diplomacy, because related to the next point, United States is fundamentally winning the communication game, the ideological game. Fundamentally, nobody, even you, don't trust RT. 
And even you don't trust CGTN, Chinese television or whatever. Even you have a problem with that because they are bad. You know, they don't know how to be sophisticated. That's interesting. Uh, I see people of the left on Facebook, on which you are not, where they often share things from CNN and BBC. You know, they may make a comment, a point about how the story is terrible. But they yet are transfixed by what's being reported by BBC, by CNN, and focused on that. Either to use it as evidence of something that they want to talk about or to say how bad the coverage is. But nonetheless, our eyes are all on the Western press. In that sense, they have won the communication battle. And then you sort of embarrassingly might look at Al Jazeera, maybe a little bit. But even that is basically completely gone over to the side of imperialism. So, the political power is not as depleted as one would imagine, largely because the US diplomats have an advantage in that they have the communication battle uh, on their side. Don't underestimate that. It plays an enormous role. Um, like, for instance, this story about the April uh, peace agreement, uh, interim agreement, that has just not been reported even after Fiona Hill wrote about it. Then, you know, we come to other forms of power, which, you know, economic power. Now, it's an illusion to think that countries are going to de-dollarize immediately. De-dollarization doesn't happen overnight. Yes, the Chinese and the, the, the Russians have created mechanisms to exchange goods, but even when countries go to the People's Bank of China and they exchange renminbi for their currency, they take the renminbi and buy dollars. Because most international trade, particularly in energy markets, continues to be in dollars. Economic power is incredible. I mean, look at the way the West controls um, small currency transactions through the SWIFT system, um, you know, which is based in Europe. They just shut the SWIFT system off for Iran, shut it off for this country, shut it off for that country, or seize the gold from Venezuela, just like that in the Bank of... You can ask, why did the Venezuelans put their gold in the Bank of London? Well, that's a separate question. The point is, they just seize the gold. It's piracy. They can just do that because they control the international capital markets and that's key. Even when you talk to Chinese diplomats, they concede that capital markets are controlled by the US. In fact, Chinese banks denominate their own um, you know, holdings in dollars. Uh, they reverse to dollars to see what their holdings are. You know, they, they haven't had the confidence to say, no, the renminbi is the key currency, etc. So economic power is amazing. And so what we began to talk about is not the decline or the resilience, but the fragility. I think that the US empire is e extremely fragile at this point, and fragility has its own problems. Uh, some of this fragility has to do with the fact that the United States ex itself is a greatly declining country. In immense partisanship um, at the political level, inability to get infrastructure passed, inability to restart industry. In fact, when they just talked about the new semiconductor bill, the uh, government official who announced the bill said that, you know, we've neglected investments in this area for decades. That was her talking. She's right. Um, so that brings me to my final point, which is about why do I think, apart from everything else, there is this conflict in Ukraine um, in about two minutes or so. Uh, yeah, um, it's a tough conflict, and I, I'm sorry for you because this is the hardest part of the world to have a discussion about the Ukraine war. I got to say that you know I was recently in Brazil. Before that, I was in South Africa. I have the world's best job. <laughs> Being a, a for, whatever foreign correspondent, it's an amazing job. I get to travel to places like you know all over the world. It's really difficult for me personally building a like a sane life, but it's an incredible job. But what I've been finding in South Africa and Brazil, certainly in other parts of South America, is that people are just not paying attention to this war except in terms of its inflation consequences. They're just not paying attention. 55 heads of government in Africa belong to the African Union. Only two of them, two legitimate ones, four came but only two legitimate ones, came to listen to Vladimir Zelensky when he addressed the EU. Only two. That's extraordinary. President of South Africa did not show up. Didn't even send an ambassador. It's extraordinary. Um, the 
attitude toward this conflict is very different. It's reminiscent, and I don't know if you have this in the bookshop, but reminiscent of M. S. Cesar's terrific text, Discourse on Colonialism. You've got to read that text. It will give you a sense of why so many countries, including India, which is deeply subordinate to the United States, this government's foreign policy, on Russia, not at all. India, in fact, has been buying up um, assets that American oil companies are trying to get rid of at a discount, so it's a good deal. But India is basically telling the United States, we're not going to follow you on this. Um, so it's, this is interesting. I know it's difficult for you here, because here there has been a strong emotional reaction to this. And also because there is a view that you can't negotiate with Putin because he's a barbarian. And he is going to, if not swallow up Ukraine, then next Moldova, Latvia, Lithuania, and so on. That he is, in fact, um, a Russian expansionist. All of that uh, conversation about Putin reminds me of the way people talked about Saddam, about Gaddafi, about Bashar al-Assad, about any of these people that they don't negotiate. You can't negotiate with them. Why not? Because this is Munich, and you've got to take a stand at Munich. Um, it, it, this is always now the parallel, that these are Nazis and you have to take a stand at Munich. Very hard to have a reasonable, balanced conversation about this. In fact, I recently had a very nice conversation with a Ukrainian woman who said to me, what differentiates you and me, she said, and I thought this is actually the fault line. It's not, you know, this other place where people get upset, but she said, you believe that Ukraine can't defeat Russia. And she said, I believe Ukraine can defeat Russia. And I said, well, that actually is, is a reasonable disagreement because I don't believe Ukraine can defeat Russia. I think that would be catastrophic. We can talk about that later. Anyway, ever since the financial crisis, um, China in particular, but also Russia, began to, in, in, in my opinion, began to reassess what the head of the, the chief economist at the IMF, Raghunath Rajan, at the time he was the chief economist at the IMF, he said that the United States and China are in its satanic embrace. Very interesting phrase for the chief economist of the IMF to use. What he meant was that China was basically providing credit to the US so-called middle class to buy Chinese goods. Um, and then having bought Chinese goods, China was recycling its surplus back to the United States, it wasn't building up its own assets and so on. That was the situation till the financial crisis, 2007-2008. At the same time, Europe began to systematically lose its sources of energy, not for any other reason than these exact wars. That it's in this period that Europe lost access to Iraqi energy, certainly to Iranian energy because that ridiculous campaign against Iran starts around 2006. And then eventually by 2011, you lose access to Libyan energy because of that illegal war against Libya. So having lost all that, those sources of energy, Europe began to be much more reliant on Russian energy. German energy markets were importing about 30% from Russia uh, at the beginning of, of February. This reliance happens because of these wars, largely. You know, Libya just goes offline. Iran, almost entirely offline. Iranian pipelines could have been sending natural gas into Europe. You wouldn't have had this great winter of serious discontent that's coming. So you start to see as a consequence of Chinese reversal of thinking. Chinese will start the Belt and Road as a reaction, how to pivot away from the US market. Xi Jinping comes to office 2013. They start thinking about this Belt and Road. It's actually a way to get out of being entangled in the US market, to create new markets and so on. The Chinese start to integrate Eurasia for the first time, actually, since perhaps the Mongols. Uh, we can talk about that if you are interested. There hasn't actually been real, and that was at a different foundation. That was a unity of skulls, mountains of skulls. Uh, this is a different kind of unity. But at the same time as China was essentially pivoting into both Central Asia and eventually Europe, where I think 13 to 17 countries in Europe joined the Belt and Road Initiative, including Poland, not a socialist country at all, and Italy, again, is effectively a right-wing country, both of them, joined the Belt and Road for pragmatic reasons. Um, at the same time, 
Europe was becoming increasingly dependent on Russian energy. So you began to see the historical process of Eurasian integration. It's around this point that the United States understands that it is going to lose Europe into this whole Eurasian world. And you start to see an insistence in the Atlantic project, renewing NATO, for instance, global NATO. Um, you know, Trump coming to Germany and saying, how can you buy all this energy from the Russians? We are uh, providing you security through NATO. You need to buy energy from the United States. In other words, at great cost, liquefying natural gas in the US Gulf, shipping it to Hamburg where they don't yet have LNG terminals, then making it again uh, into gas and then piping it instead of just directly piping it from Russia. Uh, this was actually a uh, geostrategic ambition of the United States to actually either slow down or halt Eurasian integration. And Ukraine just came right in the middle of it. Um, it's a real tragedy for the Ukrainian people because they are caught in the middle of forces that are much greater than about the Donbass and the Azov Battalion and Crimea and so on. That's in the weeds. There are other things happening that are much more uh, terrifying. For instance, Lloyd Austin's um, press conference where he said the point of this war is to weaken Russia. That's actually a very chilling statement because it brings us to a dangerous precipice of a very dangerous kind of confrontation directly between Russia, which is a minor economy the size of Mexico, and yet has got very dangerous weapons. Uh, this is a clash between two countries with great weapons. Uh, cannot afford to see that as people of sensitivity, socialists, and so on. We must oppose any escalation of this war. Um, but at the same time, you in Europe need to start having a debate uh, about you, this Eurasian integration. And what is good for Europe? I mean, when will Europe produce its own foreign policy? Uh, when will Europe not be dictated to by the United States through the Trojan horse known as NATO? Um, are you going to stand up and produce a foreign policy that is not necessarily Gaullist, you know, because that has its own history and problems, because that's about French arrogance, not about European neutrality or European independence and so on. Outside, there is a pamphlet. I only have about 10 copies. That my, the institute I run, we work with Jeremy Corbyn's Peace and Justice Project, and we made a pamphlet. I, I ask you to look at it if you're interested on peace and non-alignment, trying to bring the term non-alignment into the discussion. Is there a role for it? Is there a role for us to, in a sense, fight for peace, um, rather than get caught up in a debate around this war, which I think is rather um, uncomfortable for all of us? Because, you know, and here's the last point. As a journalist, I've covered wars, they are ugly. It's, it's sometimes hard for me to see people cheering on uh, fighting. And um, the human cost is absolutely incredible. But this war, the human cost will not be merely um, in Ukraine. The human cost already is everywhere. Um, the uh, instability in Sri Lanka, the instability in Bangladesh, we're going to see a lot more of that. And let me tell you, this is not good for the left necessarily. Um, in Bangladesh, the ruling class will reassert itself. In Sri Lanka, the ruling class reasserted itself. Um, we are not in any place to take advantage of this situation. We have to think seriously about that. Well, I hope you like this book. Um, but more than anything, I hope you give it to a young person you know so that they can read through it. It's, it's a conversational text and have a sense of the hidden transcript um, of our recent past where the United States has destroyed three countries, um, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Libya. We'll never have to pay the consequences for that. And on behalf of all those Iraqis, Afghans, and Libyans that I've talked to over the years, I want you to take their story uh, to another generation so we can prevent imperialist wars like this, um, which do 100% um, harm and 0% good. Thanks a lot.
It is indeed, we are in a, a complex world and I suppose a unified European foreign policy, I think would, from a personal point of view, would also equally be a disaster. Um, <laughs> uh, because it is uh, a couple together of former empires, coupled together, uh, they'd either hang together or hang separately, and they decided they'd hang together. Uh, but I think it'd be a great danger to the world. Um, I would say, the more our enemies are divided, uh, the better. Uh, it'd be a sad case if we were calling for our enemies to unite. I, I do think that's what we need to be looking at, see where we can develop the contradictions that exist within these, uh, these uh, uh, um, combinations of countries uh, uh, in and around the European Union. I do think what BJ is talking about is, is somewhat right in the sense of the European Union was attempting to do its own uh, PESCO and develop its own military to assert its own strategy through the treaties and it had an outreach uh, through its own treaties for uh, protecting European interests 5,000 uh, 5, kilometres away from Europe, which is a long way to extend your influences. Uh, so I think there's a, these are the world in which we live and finding, I'll say this, finding ways in which to develop political strategies which advance and to, from our point of view as the ones that we need to be doing is, is forcing the Irish government into a de-escalation strategy rather than supporting NATO's escalation strategy. So I think it's all upon us just to push forward this idea of de-escalation, <coughs> calling for a ceasefire, calling for talks and um, I think that's what we need to be looking at. So just for that, I'll just anybody can put their hands up clear so I can see over here and see us. And want to ask a question? Just put your hands up clear. Hand back, yeah. Um, thanks, thanks for talking to you. I really appreciate it. Um, you mentioned that whole today um, that uh, you were a bit dissatisfied with the with the slogan that came out of the, the campaign for the Iraq War. You said that there was another issue that you thought was really appropriate. Um, I guess my mind is probably. Yeah, do you want me to answer one yeah. question or can sure. we take a few? Uh, Is anybody else got a question? Want to come in at this moment? Or you want yeah. To me? Yeah. yeah um, I suppose um, if we look at kind of uh, the West and what's happening there, um, you know, in the past we had uh, kind of social democratic movements and public housing and health and all that, but all that's gone now. And people across Europe and America are realising, well, some of them are joining us, but that's realising. We have a housing problem in Ireland and France and Spain and America, and it didn't just happen by accident. And uh, some people are waking up to, you know, the ruling class. And in relation to the uh, the Zelensky war, the, the war in Ukraine, um, when it started, yes, Putin was a, a barbarian and all the rest. But now that it's affecting people's pockets, he's not as big a barbarian as he used to be. And all of a sudden, people are saying. Well, you know, NATO did push west or push east after the the defeat of the, the Soviet Union. So, um, how how do you think? Um, do you think that the ruling classes in the, in the capitalist world are uh, putting or put them too much on the neck of wars? Yeah, there's one more here, and then I'll take all three. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, uh, I enjoyed your talk. Thanks very much. Just. Um, I have a series of questions, but I'll ask you a couple. First of all, you've spoken many times about communism and social movements, but in particular, you speak a lot about activism and how in community and international organisations we need to be a lot more active rather than sitting possibly on Facebook doing being keyboard warriors. <laughs> Maybe you could elaborate on that and what you how you see activism is. And also, could I ask you, going back to the country of your birth? I'd be quite interested, where do you see India, let's say, in 20 or 30 years? And what is your opinion on the communist movement within India? I think you have a relation in the Kolkata Politburo and the Communist Party. Um, I may be wrong there, I'm not too sure. But how, how do you see all that playing out in terms of US, China, Russia relations? Where, where do you see India moving to? Yeah, that's it. Actually, it's always great to get a number of questions because they all are connected in an interesting way, and, and, and they are. Um, you see, the thing about no blood for oil 
has a resonance in it that it's a resource war, uh, principally. You know, like, was the coup in Bolivia about lithium um, in 2019? Now, there's an element of truth to that. The, in Chile, where I live, there's a, a, we had a constitutional thing on Sunday, it lost. The Washington Post had an editorial editorializing against the referendum in the constitutional vote in Chile. And the first word in the Washington Post's editorial was lithium. Just the first word. Leave out the rest of the sentence. Resource wars are real. They really do want control over the resources. But it's not actually just to have the resources. This is not the 19th century. It's actually to have authority over where the resources go. And who else should not have the resources? Indeed, the killing of Lumumba in 61 was not to grab the Congo's resources, but to prevent the Soviets from getting access to a uranium mine in the Congo from where the uranium came for Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The US bombs had uranium from the Congo. And they were very worried. The CIA was excised about the fact that Lumumba was going to deliver that mine to the Soviets. Now, the problem wasn't that they deliver the mine to the Soviets, that the US wouldn't have access to it. So it's, in a way, it's interesting. It's about political power as well. So the war in Iraq was also a political demonstration effect. It sends a message to others. We, we minimize that sometimes in our thinking. The, after all, the oil was flowing anyway. You know? So it's not just about getting access to the oil. It's about controlling resources, but also political power. And I think as Marxists, as communists, we have to produce our understanding of reality as precisely as possible and not allow our slogans. See, we create slogans to build movements, but our slogans are not always as precise as our analysis. Because after all, our slogans are in the battle of emotions. You know, we are trying to get people excised into movements. But sometimes we take our slogans as the analysis. And I, would, I was just saying that, you know, that it's about political power as well. And that's that godfather thing. We're just going to whack them. You know, send a message. Kneecap them. <laughs> you know, you don't need to do that. Saddam is saying, sorry. I'm sorry, master. <laughs> and they're like, no, we're going to hit you anyway. And we're going to humiliate you. We're going to put you up. You know, what happened to Gaddafi is outrageous. It's a crime against humanity. You know, whatever one thinks about him, that's completely out of the you know, bounds of... And then Hillary Clinton goes on TV and says, you know, we came, we, whatever did, we won. I've forgotten. She was doing the Caesar line. We came, we saw he died. We came, we saw he died, and she started laughing. I mean, that's barbaric, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, frankly, I, I don't feel happy even when an adversary dies. Mm -hmm. And I must say, I wrote a very balanced ob obituary, the death of Gorbachev. Uh, <laughs> super balanced. I really have to hold back. I mean, uh, you know, I was extraordinarily balanced. <laughs> I didn't even mention the pizza at commercial. <laughs> uh, you know, I was mainly focused on the fact that I wanted to tell my readers that I read his memoir from 96, which is this big. It's a very interesting memoir, where Gorbachev tries to say it wasn't me, it was Yeltsin. <laughs> uh, which is, you know, yes, but it was also you. And it was also the Politburo you created. Um, and the you know, Presidium and so on. They brought in a lot of unscrupulous characters into Gorbachev's Presidium at the time. I mean, they basically come, they assassinated the Communist Party of that period. And who brought Yeltsin in as party head in Moscow? It wasn't Brezhnev, you know, long dead. It was Gorbachev. But in his book and then in Taubman's biography, they keep saying, you know, it's not Gorbachev. So, but meanwhile, here's Hillary Clinton saying, ha ha ha, he died. I mean, what kind of people are these, frankly? Just as human beings. One should never be like that. Socialists should never be like that ever. You know, we should 
we should have we should inculcate in our own cadre the the capacity to feel for everybody you know some level of humanity must be there um, and that my friend is why i felt that the analysis was too mechanical in a way right it has to be broader and and so on i mean it's true that that these issues of livelihood will impact people's consciousness um i'm sure that that's happening but it's not happening everywhere um even inside uh europe in in some places including in germany polling at least suggests an adverse situation i don't know if you saw recently there was a problem in the bundestag because sara wagenach was uh, selected by de linker to speak in the energy committee the highly polarizing figure in de linker and there was a huge drama in the bundestag because people were like no she can't be allowed to speak and so on. you know german democracy um, is a very well known country for its history of democratic uh, governance um, and and so there's this drama there because there are significant numbers of people who have absorbed the idea that you know we should do something um, i mean look at england i don't know what happened to paul macy um because you know i remember a time when he was a very reasonable center left sort of character now paul mason is running around calling for arming ukraine and so on you know this is a constituency it's real and i wonder i wonder what you're saying about the contradictions of what this will mean to popular opinion because of the livelihood issues that's been debated but i think it's a open question I don't know if necessarily there will be waves of people saying let's stop this war because we need energy. Um I don't know. I'm not sure about it. I I don't actually know the European firmament that well. But I do know that in other parts of the world people are furious. And interestingly they are not furious at the Russians. That's what I find interesting in other parts of the world. The focus is on NATO. And that's because people have experienced the blood blow of nato so for them the question of nato isn't an abstraction i had a debate with somebody recently a liberal from uh, somewhere in one of the eastern european countries who kept going on and on about how i don't understand when but you, nato is a defensive alliance <laughs> he kept saying the word defensive alliance and i said but my friend nato bombed afghanistan and libya what defense what how was libya threatening the anything to do with your i mean maybe gaddafi was going to kill all the people in benghazi but that's hardly a city in italy the italians tried to make benghazi an italian city uh, they failed but you know where is this defensive but that's an attitude it's a kind of arrogance that somehow nato is not and that's why ms cesar's book is interesting um because it suggests that you know the horror is always going to be for europe the holocaust not the colonial wars not the brutality of colonialism look at the uk basically consideration of colonialism is becoming illegal you know churchill is still considered a god i grew, i was born in bengal not far away from the places where between 1 and 3 million people died i was born in 1967 But in 1943, actually now in 1943, it's an anniversary. Between one and three million people died there because Churchill made a decision: take the grain away from there, send it to the troops. Now, maybe he had a legitimate reason: troops need to be fed to defeat Hitler. But one to three million people died. This is not taught to children in England. They are taught to revere Winston Churchill, you know, a racist imperialist. So. there is an ideological component here which i think sometimes interrupts the material realities of people you know which is why fidel castro always told us we have to conduct the battle of ideas and recently i said will not only the battle of ideas also the battle of emotions you can't touch people you know the battle of ideas is one thing because sometimes material analysis you know my analysis my pocket book is not enough Um, we saw that in chile recently in this election where evangelism played an enormous role and let me tell you evangelism is coming to ireland it's already there in belfast and in antrim 
It's coming. It is a force. And that comes to the question of organizing. Because, you know, I've interviewed young people in the favelas in Brazil who go to Pentecostal churches. All of them will say similar things. One, I'm giving one example. They'll say, I want to learn to play the guitar, so I go to the Pentecostal church. Because, you know, in many ways, the state has abandoned the poor. There are no state institutions, as we know, you know. Even here, I bet, there's a lot less community centers and places for the working class to gather, you know. There are places also then they can train in things, like learn to play the guitar. Not only has the state abandoned these communities, but in many ways the left also. That we also don't have community spaces where our comrades are going and, you know, doing things that the young working class children need. And then these churches play a disproportionate role. So kids are going to the church service not because they want to, you know, speak in tongues, but they want to learn the guitar, they want to do all kinds of other things that are being offered to them. Oh, one of them told me something interesting. My parents, when I finish school, they want me to come home. But the thing they will allow me to do is to go to the church. Because then I can meet my friends there. So that becomes like a place to hang out, you know. And that's an interesting development. So when we organize, we have to organize in the lives of people. Our organizing is not to come to a demonstration, you know, which is what we have become habituated to do. Like when I joined a communist movement in India, I remember it was kind of, we go to people and say, come to this, we mobilize people for demonstrations. But we've got to actually enter the lives of people. And this is part of that slogan, rescuing the collective life. You know, we, we have to be involved there. And I, I'm sure people on, um, in this republic are involved in that level, I'm sure. Uh, which is why you don't have so many of the hideous problems other people have. Um, but, you know, for the world, this is a big issue. And we are seeing the growth of, it's not only Christianity. In the Muslim world, there's a movement called Tablighi Jamaat which is very much like the Pentecostalism of Islam. And they play an enormous role, you know, um, the Muslim Brotherhood also. Uh, they have, you know, basically professionals, lawyers, bankers, doctors, and so on, and they intervene in the lives of poor kids. And that has a lasting impact, which in my generation, the communist movement had, you know, including local reading clubs and things, uh, comic book, lending library was run in my neighborhood by a communist. So kids would go there and read comic books in his reading library and he would tell us about, you know, he would give his interpretation of the world, which was fascinating for me. I don't remember any of it, but he was a grown up talking to us like we, we meant something. And I think churches end up doing that. And we are losing that game. so much for giving the talk which I really enjoyed it. Um, I, uh, I, I just had a question in relation to, um, it strikes me uh, these days that a lot of people who uh, are retrospectively for peace in relation to the Iraq war, mm -hmm. uh, uh, who at the same time find themselves in favour of the continuation of, for example, the war in Ukraine. Um, in relation to Syria, there are many, you know, Western leftists, some of them very renowned anarchists who may have changed their position <laughs> in relation to the Syrian conflict. Uh, I'm just wondering how do you explain that contradiction in, in, in
convincing people that we have this, uh, I suppose, retrospective sense to say, oh, I was always against it, and yet when we're tested in the present moment, when leftists are tested in the present moment, they uh, capitulate uh, to the forces of reaction. So, one more. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, just how do you see the role of individualism uh, currently there? I think particularly in the West, seems to be kind of a, a poison in a lot of ways like it, not just in, in a general sense in society but even among the left it's kind of a thing of you know people are sort of they'll pick their politics rather than as a, as a state of the conviction it's more like oh you know you're picking like a, a chocolate bar in a shop kind of a thing you know you go for the aesthetics and like how do you see the way like kind of what you were talking about before the way of uh, responding to that and kind of building that collective um, ethos from, from the ground up when it's being suppressed every single day? Well, let me start with the most promising place in the world, which is Latin America, where I live, which is, you know, fortuitous for me, except I live in Santiago, which is not really part of South America. It might be a kind of European city in Latin America. That's what people criticize it for. It's unfortunate characterization because it's wrong. Um, I wrote an article a while back based on a bunch of interviews I had done across the continent on the four phases of the Cuban Revolution. Um, a lot opens up when Cuba has its revolution in 59. And after, subsequent to that, if we see what's going on, you know, there's a whole talk about the new pink tie. And this is a lazy analysis, in my opinion, because it doesn't try to understand what's the character of it. So I would say this is the fourth phase. So what are the four phases? The first phase was the revolution itself in Cuba, and it set in motion a kind of focoism, you know, the guerrilla movements, whether it's in, you know, in Venezuela, Douglas Bravo, in Central America, people inspired by the example of Cuba, a break with their communist parties, go out into the jungle. In uh, Colombia, it's actually significant that the um, armed struggle from the Communist Party takes place in 64. That's five years after the Cuban Revolution, when they make a determination that building our movement in the cities is going nowhere. We'll have a city and rural strategy now and so on. That's the first phase. That phase was largely destroyed by direct, uh, sorry, by indirect US intervention through a series of coups and through the project called Project Condor which is largely forgotten now. The first coup being in Brazil in 1964, a coup that lasts for 21 years. It's pretty incredible. So that's the first phase, which is really shut down by vicious military violence in South America. All the juntas that come, the coup in 73 in Chile, 76 in Argentina, all these coups basically are part of the crackdown on the Cuban revolution, the cleaning up of the Foucault strategy, you know? They go after the Montaneros, they go after all the various groups. Then the second opening takes place in the Caribbean. Um, that's in Maurice Bishop's uh, New Jewel movement in Granada, the Nicaraguan Revolution in 79, both at the same time, and the various guerrilla movements in everywhere except Belize and Costa Rica, effectively. Um, you know, and even in Honduras, there was actually unlikely, but there were movements and so on. So that was the second phase. There, it was destroyed by the so-called dirty wars, direct intervention by the US, uh, funding of the Contras and so on. And they, they just shut that down. Remember, the United States invades Grenada because they claim that there are Cubans there. There were Cuban technicians building the airport. But anyway, invades Grenada in 79 and so on. Shut down the second wave. Third wave opens with Chavez. Um, Chavez has to be seen as a wave of the Cuban Revolution. Um, his brother, for instance, was part of a Foucault strategy, early Adnan Chavez, of an earlier kind of Foucault strategy which had remained intact but was not going anywhere, um, partly because there was no room anymore. He himself attempts a coup d'etat um, after the Caracaso. That also gets shut down. He then reassesses and comes up with this idea we have to use the democratic institutions. And that's the, second, the third wave. Because he sets in motion, in a sense, confidence that in Bolivia, for instance, uh, there was already this trajectory of the cycle of protests in Cochabamba, uh, in El Alto, and so on. And then that gets formulated around the electoral strategy. 
building these large electoral coalitions. It's very interesting. It's actually quite recent that the left in Latin America has taken on this, let's use the Chilean phrase, frente amplio, you know, the broad front. It's not, doesn't go back to the 60s. They were too busy in the forest. It's actually after Chavez that this strategy that then Gustavo Petro uses, you know, the big broad umbrella front of all political actors, social movements, Congress, the Congress of the Peoples, uh, Communist Party, the Communas, and so on. That's a strategy that Chavez puts on the table. And it has an image, but he's lucky. The US is distracted by the war in Iraq. Commodity prices are high. And he has the, the foresight to put on the table regional integration as a key instrument of developing power. It's a very clever strategy. Well, that gets destroyed by a couple of things. You know, one is commodity prices collapse. There was a lot of reliance on commodity prices. And now the United States uses a very sophisticated strategy of the hybrid war to go after some of these governments. You know, the kind of sanctions of, against um, Venezuela, for instance, sanctions against Nicaragua, the lawfare in Brazil, which knocks out um, Dilma in, in 2016 and then puts Lula in jail. Um, this strategy is used across the continent. It collapses. Well, now we are in the fourth wave. What's the fourth wave? In my opinion, the fourth wave can only be a social democratic wave. It cannot actually advance a socialist agenda. Because this, the material condition is simply not there. The left is largely been, as a consequence of this hybrid war, and to some extent, these other things like Syria and so on, the left turned up against itself, fragmented deeply, decomposed the large coalitions and so on. Where they've been able to knit together, like in Colombia, it's a good example of Chile, the left was a junior partner. In fact, Daniel Hadwe, the mayor of Recoleta, runs <coughs> as a candidate for the presidency on the Frente, Frente Amplio ticket. And he's defeated by Boric, by something like 65 to 35. It's a big win for the center left, as it were, against the left. So the left has to enter these coalitions as a very junior partner. In Gustavo's coalition in, in, in Colombia, the left is a marginal force. The terms are dictated by the center left. Even though Gustavo Petro himself is a Marxist and a very uh, considerable person, he recognizes, you know, it's the old line from the German ideology. That, the, that communism is the real movement of history. It, it's not something you voluntaristically impose on society. You have to understand where you are and build from there and so on. So in that sense, I think this is not a new pink tide. That's a very lazy analysis. It's the fourth wave after the Cuban revolution and it's a social democratic wave, which the previous one was not. The previous one was about regional integration and to some extent socialism but regional integration. That was the key development. And it's no surprise that therefore Chavez, the, uh, after Chavismo, the other word that's there is Bolivarianism, because it's about the regionalism that's key to that phase. Now, I just interviewed uh, Fernando Haddad, who's going to be most likely, he's running as the candidate to be the governor of Sao Paulo state. Uh, he was previously the candidate against Bolsonaro, got 45% of the vote against Bolsonaro. But Haddad said that Lula, if he wins, is going to drive both regional integration and reviving the BRICS. Now, can Lula open a new door? Because actually, right now, only Brazil can open a door. You know, Gustavo Petro's government and Francia Marque is too weak, actually, in terms of the balance of forces. But Lula could open a door. I'm not optimistic, by the way. I actually think that right now, we are at a social democratic period in, in that region. And that's better than what it was, which is, you know, a nest of reactionary governments. So, you know, am I in favor of social democracy? Not at all. But I'm also a materialist. I don't want to fantasize of, about things. And one should not go around saying, well, you know, it's a great left. The left has returned in South America or in Latin America. That's ridiculous. Because then you're setting yourself for great disappointment. Like when Boric said, you know, we are for Ukraine. And people said, how dare Boric? Boric is a center-left social democrat. What, what, why are you... So, don't set yourself up for disappointment. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Syria war was horrible. I was based in Beirut then and covered it not as much as some of my colleagues, but quite a lot. It was a horrible, horrible war. It was ugly. Uh, I covered it from the Turkish border side, from the Kalamun Mountains, those wars are ugly. Um, 
What I found interesting in the debates that took place around them was, again, there was a lack of human feeling in the debate, you know. And there's a tendency in sections of the metropolitan left to want to bring their idea of revolution on a bomb dropped by a NATO plane. <laughs> Gilbert Ashkar, for instance, professor in London, is very much like that. Always denies it, but somehow always comes in saying, yes, let's overthrow Gaddafi, and then the revolution can start. You know, this kind of accelerationist, that let the NATO do the bombing and then the revolution. It doesn't work like that, my friend. Uh, we, we don't have evidence of that. Never have, a, have we seen this. Uh, there was a previous British professor who said the same about the Iraq war. He's the one who coined the term Saddam is a, um, is a some kind of fa Islamo-fascist, which is ridiculous because Saddam was not Islamic in that sense. He's, he didn't represent the forces of Islam. Uh, but anyway, what was his name? He was a famous Arab, Arabist, as they are called in, in the English language. Um, I've often found that to be ridiculous because it also minimizes the extent of human suffering. You know, it's, it's like what we're saying, you know, let's fight this war till the last Ukrainian. You know, there were leftists who were saying, let's fight that war till the last Syrian. Um, that was a ridiculous war. And I'll tell you something funny about it. As a reporter, I traveled in that region before. Traveling in Libya, you go up to a military camp and you could just walk right in. There was no guard, nothing. You know, Libya was that kind of society. You could stroll in, you could buy cigarettes from the commissary. It was, and which is why when in March of 2011, the Benghazi battalion defected to the rebellion. You know, because there was just no discipline. It was a different situation. In Egypt, it's different. In Egypt, all the commanding officers basically have that sort of Pakistani clipped English accents. You know, the Sandhurst type train. They are taller, they come from Lower Egypt, meaning from Alexandria or Cairo, you know, they have fairer skin. And all the soldiers come from Upper Egypt. You know, they are darker skinned, smaller fellows. They come from the rural areas of Egypt. And when that Tahrir Square started, there was really no activity in Upper Egypt, in rural Egypt. Very little activity. It was largely an urban phenomenon. So when the generals with their clipped accent did this, the soldiers came from rural areas and they shot people. Uh, there was no way to break the army, as it were. Uh, so you had to understand the sociology of the army in a society. I tell you something, in Syria, I've never been able to enter a military base. Super disciplined, quite, you know, th there was almost no defection. If you look the whole war, there was no defection. If you understand that, it becomes irresponsible to say to people, keep fighting the war to over, you know, because it's just going to become a bloodbath for people, you know? And people then started to believe, and this is where the US and, and British uh, should be held responsible. US ambassador goes in Dara, right in the beginning in 2011, into a crowd and says to the people, we are with you. That encourages people to start saying, okay, then the American planes are coming. You know, it's really irresponsible. And same the Western left that said, you know, we are with you. You're building popular committees and so on. Popular. We have been building popular committees in India for years. We are never going to call the Western left to come and bomb Modi. You know, I have two authors sitting in jail. We are not screaming and crying and saying, come and bomb Modi to help us. We don't need your help. We'll make our own revolution. There's an attitude has developed that the Western left will be the white savior leftists. And I fear that there's a lot of this kind of messianic leftism that exists in Europe, that people need to check themselves. You know, it's a whole colonial mentality. Let's go and save the this, let's go and save the that. And how are you going to save them? You're going to send your military, your military. You know, I, I, again, I'm picking on Paul Mason, but I heard him recently <laughs> talking about NATO as if it's his NATO. You know, we've got to do this for NATO. I'm thinking, have you lost your mind? NATO policy is developed in Washington, D.C. It's not developed by the British citizenry. Okay? That's a fantasy. And by the way, Britain is a strange thing. They wanted Brexit so badly. They didn't want Brussels control over British institutions. But why don't they do Brexit from NATO? I never understood that. You want Brexit from economic regulation, but not NATO. Well, but that's their problem. 
So Syria has created a lot of problem in the Western left. I grant you that. Enormous divisions are created. Unhealable divisions, maybe. But these are people that I don't think we should always take that seriously. You know, I think flame wars online against them are a big mistake, frankly. Um, they are colonialists. That's how they see the world. You know, they want to save people. Instead of saving them with Bibles, they'll sa save them with bombs. And that's exactly what the old colonials did. You know, um, you don't want the new kind of Western colonial to show up with bombs and Das Kapital, for instance. That's a nightmare for me. Uh, so in other words, we don't need you to help us. I mean, I have comrades here, you know, comrades who have come, who were born, brought up in India. It's not easy in India either. We have our own comrades getting killed. In Kerala, they are fighting a battle against the far right. Uh, our comrades keep getting slaughtered there, killed by the far right. In the coastline, Mangalore coastline, these forces of the far right constantly harass and kill our people. Uh, in Bengal, we lost hundreds of comrades in the space of, but we didn't go yelling to the Western left and say, help us. Please bring a Security Council resolution and <laughs> come and bomb Modi. No, we'll, we will deal with our own. My great teacher, Ayaz Ahmed, used to say, every country gets the fascism it deserves. <laughs> so we'll deal with our own fascism, you know, in that sense. Um, I think I've been through almost all the questions. Individualism. Uh, yeah, but except that that's not individualism. You're talking about consumerism. And it's related to this attitude toward the left. I mean, why are we involved in the left? I, I don't know about you, but principal reason I got involved in the left was to abolish hunger, frankly. It wasn't to be correct in an internet debate. You know, I don't care if I'm wrong in the debate or my line is sometimes withery or Somebody says, oh, you are a revisionist. I don't really care about all that. What did you do today to end hunger? And I don't mean by feeding somebody a sandwich. What have you done to advance the forces that are going to abolish hunger? So uh, there's a lot of chatter online. Oh, I'm a Chinese agent, for instance. <laughs> you know, you are a... Uh, <clears throat> Look at my clothes, man. <laughs> I mean, the only thing I spend my precious money on are my shoes. Because I fundamentally believe that one of the downsides of masculinity is lack of concern for footwear. <laughs> I think masculinity has to really take a hit on this one. Also, to some extent, hair care. Uh, grooming of facial hair is important. But shoes, definitely. But yeah, I mean, Chinese agent, I wish, you know, uh, <laughs> Xi Jinping, marry me. <laughs> what do I care? You know, it's hardly a, a thing, but it's a, such a silly thing, you know. You're, but why? But because I actually believe that the Chinese have done something amazing. Um, they had a revolution in 1949. It's a wretchedly backward country like India in 1947. India had two years on China lead. Look at India and China today. You can't compare them. India is a caste-ridden, wretched society with deep, deep inequality and terrible problem with hunger. Probably either one out of every two Indians or one out of every three Indians suffers from hunger every day. And in China, they have abolished absolute poverty. Now, tell me, we have something to learn from them. But we can't in India say this because the government then will say you are an agent of China. You know, we are always harassed by the government, this case, that case, etc. It's all nonsense. I don't need to take Chinese money, but I do look at the Chinese example. And I do understand that they have done something which very few global south countries have been able to do. From a position of extraordinarily poverty. And imagine, if you go look at the data, 1949, it was a hideously poor country. Uh, India had 13% literacy when the British left. Thanks, Britain, for all that bloody civilization. All those hundreds of years, and then you only educated 13% of the population. Wow, what civilization you gave us. Amazing. Uh, and that too, we are better at you in English. So, uh, so there's that. Uh, thanks, you know, a lot. Uh, but this uh, idea of, you know, China this, China that, you see, this whole thing that's happened in our, even in our left groups, this whole feeling of I have to be right, 
I have to be the most right person. Even that I find objectionable. I have to have the correct line. But it leads firstly to splitting from the whole world. Because you have to build a movement. I mean, now, Comrade and I may not agree on everything. But we have to work together to build socialism. Socialism isn't the product of the right person's brain. That's idealism. You know, that I have meditated like Buddha and come up with absolute perfect socialist formula and now I radiate this idea to the whole world. Doesn't work like that, man. You have to go house to house. You have to teach kids to play the guitar. You have to work to end hunger and so on. For that, you're going to have to work with people you don't entirely agree with or find pleasant. That second part is really important in our movement. Um, right? You have to build a movement, a struggle and so on. So I completely reject not just the idea of consumerism, you know, pick the correct flavor of left that you like, but I hate the attitude that comes with it, which is that I'm more right than you. And my feeling is, I don't, you know, okay, you are more right than me, you win. Now what did you do today to end hunger? What did you do today to advance the causes of freedom? What have you done? And a lot of this consumerism of the left is a product of social media. I think a lot of it comes down to that. Years ago, I learned from one of my teachers that, you know, it's fine to have a reading of a text. And by the way, I came to socialism not from reading. I came to socialism from going to demonstrations and fighting the police and so on. I used to find that the most exciting thing. You know, uh, I had a kind of punk rock mentality to communism uh, as a kid. I was completely illiterate. I'd go to party classes and be like, oh God, I'm going to have to read these boring books. Uh, I don't want to read this. Let's tell us what to do next, comrade. You know, when is the line? Can stand at the police line and shake that yellow barrier. Push the cops and jump over the line. And our party branch secretaries to say you're a hooligan. You know? <laughs> but then Mayakovsky was called by Lenin a hooligan. You know, I read that later, I was super proud. <laughs> I'm a hooligan like Mayakovsky, wow. I take that any day, you know, rather than a person who's sitting reading everything. You know, it's like the person who knows all the statistics about cricket, but doesn't know how to play. You know those people? They can tell you who has the, done the best this and who plays on this pitch, but they don't play. Or same with football, they know everything and they don't play. You've got to play. Building communism is about play. It's not about getting the reading right. You've got to read too. You've got to study, you've got to argue, you've got to debate. But even reading is about arguing and debating. It's not about reading and saying, I have the line. Right? So I, not only do I reject the consumerist aspect, but there's also this kind of holier-than-thou aspect that comes with it. You've got to admit that nobody really knows everything. You know, a lot of the stuff that I've said today you'll find wrong, objectionable, whatever, and that's good. Guess why? Because I'm a human being and I have all kinds of crazy ideas. You know, and so do you. And we should engage. And that's why that attitude is bad, in my opinion. I'll take two more questions and that'll be it. A chance of so I can see clear. Man and then there, I think, yeah. Yeah. And then all of you. Oh, oh, that's a great T-shirt. That's that new campaign, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I came on the launch of that campaign. That's a great campaign. Yes. Man in the red. Is it red? I think yeah. it is. Yep. And like in Britain, it's very dynamic. If you're talking about, I see it in the climb. Well, like the solutions put out by choice, just their refusal to like admit what's going down the line in terms of energy prices. And just the points that you're making about hunger, the, the points that you're making about hunger, they're now more and more a feature uh, growing in European societies. And just like this coming winter, in terms of like just essential staple foods and essential energy, like things are spiraling out of control. So in terms of a perspective about like class struggle developing in Europe, in the short medium term, what do you think? What's your perspective on that? Great. My question is about, uh, it's actually about what you were talking about earlier, an example of the Cuban Revolution. And uh, like, uh, th these days, Cuba has uh, like, uh, like one thing that wasn't spoken about, so that really was environmentalism as well. 
and all the catastrophe that awaits us. Cuba has a this program called the Life Park Life Task, which is like the how to mitigate um, climate change within around the island. But it's, Cuba's only like a little island in the Caribbean, and it's surrounded by other countries that aren't aren't paying attention to that. It's also, it's that all that can be mitigated at the moment, you know. Um, and how do you see the how do you see a, how can we project the, the example of Cuba and what they're doing to the to the world? Like, just, like it, things are going to heat up with the Ukraine war. And it's all it's all violence. Um, money. Uh, it's all production. Produce more weapons. Explosions. Bombs. All that. And, and about um, like in Ireland, we're talking about re re and yeah, reigniting the heat generators and coal and that. Like it's all going a long way. You know? So how do you see? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to take too much time, but, uh, you know, it, it, when I said that thing about Churchill and how one to three million people died in the province where I was born, the province of Bengal, 1943, um, actually that was the birth of the communist movement in Bengal, in a real sense, because the communists first broke the story. Our newspaper, People's War, broke the story. Kalpana Dutt, she was the main correspondent. We had artists like Ch uh, Chitta Prasad did woodcuts and charcoal drawings of the famine. And then Sunil Jana took photographs. We broke the story, the communist press. But more than that, the communist movement from the 40s into the 50s started what was known as the food movement. A very important uh, provincial campaign. It was a campaign to raise the issue of hunger. And it was the left that took up the banner, not as the left, but it was known as the food movement. You know, like an emergency mobilization against hunger. Um, I wonder if that kind of approach would be valuable in, in societies today. Uh, certainly in India, this is already on the table. You know, so in, in some states of India, the left has started to do public kitchens, for instance. This started in the pandemic again. It, it had happened about maybe 15 years ago in Telangana. Uh, during a period of great hunger from drought, the communists went and created public kitchens where they fed people and so on. Um, but a food movement is very important for the left to take leadership on. And building that kind of campaign brings other forces under your um, leadership in that sense, including liberal groups and charities and so on. But the left should lead that, should not leave that space empty in my opinion. You know, as this crisis is going to increase, it's important for us to be on the streets with it. I mean, this goes back to rescuing the collective life, in a way, as an example. And as a consequence of the food movement, the left won the election. The communists won an election in Bengal in 67, and then in 77, and then governed for 34 years. Now, we lost our way in that process. I, I can talk about that for hours, but I don't want to bore you. But we really made a hash of it in those 34 years. We did have great advances in terms of land reform and so on. But we struggled with one particular problem, which is that our best cadre went into government and the movement suffered. And I know that in any country where you win an election, I know that, I don't know your personal opinion about Sinn Féin, but Sinn Féin likely will win the election in a couple of years. If Sinn Féin comes, will they send their best cadre into government? Because what will that do to your neighborhood committees what will that do to your local movement building capacity or party building capacity? We suffered from that. In Kerala, where the left is in power and has been re-elected, the government has been much smarter. It hasn't brought the best people 
into government. Now, then the government suffers, but not really. You have to train your cadre to be in government, you know, but you've got to keep building the mass movements. Even when you win an election, you have to build the street. If you lose the people, you've forgotten that as, as socialists, we are not trying to win power over the state. We are trying to win power over society. We are trying to have hegemony over society. The state is merely an instrument of that. I think sometimes we lose way and we think, oh, let's win elections and then we'll govern. Then you merely administer society. And we as communists are not about administering society. We are about society learning to administer itself and the state becoming our instrument, right? That's what Lenin has taught us in State and Revolution. Go read that. It's a terrific text, by the way. And written on his knee while he's running hither and yon back into the uh, into Tsarist Russia or then into Kerensky's Russia. Then he's in Finland writing on his knee that text, which is an extraordinary text. Highly recommend it. Um, you know, again, it's not a well worked out thesis typed on a computer in a professor's office. You know, he wrote it in little bits of paper and so on. Very interesting text. I highly recommend. Um, you know, the question of Cuba is interesting. And, and also, of course, the climate. And I'm not going to say a lot. About the climate, actually, I welcome you to come to our website, thetricontinental.org. We have a really interesting publication recently about the Green New Deal. Uh, and our kind of friendly critique of it. Uh, friendly critique because we are interested in the debate. You know, we don't want to just junk it. But I don't think it's an adequate way to approach the question because it's all about somehow green capitalism saving the day. When I think we need to think about degrowth in the North. And I'm not getting into this now because it's a sensitive time, but maybe this high inflation is going to lead to degrowth by itself in the North people's ability to buy things. But again, degrowth is not going to happen in the North. What you're going to get is a class attack. The attack is going to come on the working class, on people who are marginal earners and so on. So this is not really degrowth. Uh, degrowth will have to mean to some extent are taking away the vast wealth of the people of the North, uh, the billionaires and so on, who are sitting on mountains of wealth, putting that towards mitigation and so on. But have a look at that text, it's pretty good on the Green New Deal. You know, comrade, we have to do a lot in terms of Cuba. Uh, we have to produce a new kind of Cuba solidarity. Too much of our Cuba solidarity is nostalgic. And comrades on the island are very uh, sympathetic to what I'm saying to you. In other words, it's not enough to talk about Fidel and Che and so on. We have to introduce people to the actual Cuban revolution today. So that people are not surprised when those things happen as they did, you know, July last year, small protests here and there. People need to understand the stresses and strains on the Cuban revolution. Um, they need to understand who the new leadership is, what are the developments in the committee to defend the revolution and so on. I think in the Cuba solidarity movement, it's too fueled by nostalgia. It's insufficiently fueled by a hard-nosed analysis of the current situation in Cuba, both good and bad. For instance, good, exactly what you talked about. I, I don't know, you, you probably have read Helen Yaffe's book on Cuba. It's a great book, but we need to extract the material from there and make pamphlets and circulate it, you know? The book is too much for most people to read. It's got a lot of information, but you know, you, if you are in the Cuba solidarity movement, should extract and do a pamphlet on Cuba's ability to make um, you know, vaccines, for instance, or Cuba's uh, green uh, strategy. We need to be going out there and producing a new generation of Cuba solidarity, not relying on you know, our love for Che Guevara Lynch, that great Irish leader <laughs> who conducted uh, the Cuban revolution and so on. Um, you know, so my feeling with that is I'm, I have strong feelings about this because I think we lose in the battle of ideas if we don't go to people with a story about the theory of the Cuban revolution now and not just with more posters of, of you know, of Fidel standing, which of course we adore and they adorn all our homes, but I don't know if a, you know, a 15 year old kid is going to look at that and feel the same as I did when I first saw it. So we need to, in a sense, and here comes the Blairite language. We need to modernize some of the things we do. Uh, there's the borrowing. <laughs> so, so there it is. Um, great to be with you all. And uh, I guess, yeah, you finished. 
Well, I'm happy as all. Thanks, BJ. Yeah. Yeah.